Our next speaker is Dr. Chris Exley. Claire Dwoskin of the Children's Medical Safety Research Institute is one of the Achieving Optimal Health Conference's founding partners and amazing supporters of this conference. She's also a greater friend to, and even a better person. This year, Claire and her organization has brought us Dr. Chris Exley. Chris has been studying the effects of aluminum on living organisms for over 30 years. His research career has focused on an interesting question. Why is the third most abundant element on the Earth's crust non-essential and largely harmful to life? Specifically, Chris has examined the link between aluminum and Alzheimer's disease. Armed with the information that Chris is going to tell us today, it's going to be true that we can actually fight chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's. So Chris, please join us. It's a new one on me. Rocky and the great energy that you have here. So <laughs> good morning. I, I had an introduction. I don't think I need it. So I'll just thank the organizers for the invitation. And uh, similarly to Kristen, who just spoke, we've only got, actually, my slide was doctored, because it actually said we had five minutes of questions, but apparently we don't. So let me just say now that what I'm going to do is go through a series of slides, each of which might normally be a two-hour lecture by me. And once I start talking, some of you have heard me before, will know it's difficult for me to stop. So take note something you want to talk about, either contact me by email or find me today. I'm more than happy to talk about anything. That's the reason why I'm here and why I want to talk to you today. And what we're going to do today uh, is I'm going to actually give you the same talk that I gave to a high-powered academic group in Berlin last week. I'm going to maybe go a little bit more quickly over some areas so as to not to dwell too much on the specific science. I want to tell you a story, but this is a story which is totally science-based. And I will finish with some of the newest data, data which is currently still being argued about in the review process. And you'll see why when you see those data. All this slide tells you is that as we just heard in my introduction, you know, aluminium is the third most abundant element of the Earth's crust. Oxygen the most, silicon, and aluminium. Everything we walk on is made of oxygen, aluminium, and silicon. This creates a really fascinating paradox for me, because the most abundant metal of the Earth's crust has absolutely no biological function. All other abundant elements, abundant metals, have a biological function. Why doesn't aluminium? And that's the raison d'etre of my research. Not Alzheimer's disease, but simply understanding that. Why something so abundant has had apparently no impact upon life on Earth. Well, apart from giving us something to walk on and ski down and things like this. So we get to a slide like this, which is what is actually happening right now in this room in every part of your everyday life. We are exposed to aluminium in so many different ways. Again, if I was just to ask to list them, we would run out of time very quickly for this talk. So I just use this slide again so that you know we're living in what I call the aluminium age. There is aluminium in every single cell in your body. That aluminium is biologically reactive. That aluminium has no benefit that we know of. We know that aluminium is toxic for a wide variety of reasons, including in humans. So the aluminium age, there may well be a range of diseases that are important with respect to the aluminium age, and here is just potentially a few of them, with perhaps the most, the one that most people have heard about, perhaps the most controversial Alzheimer's disease at the center. So this is where we're going to go today. We're going to talk about the brain. 
And we're also going to talk about the elephant in the room, which in the field of Alzheimer's disease is aluminium, aluminum. I consider myself to be a very serious scientist. I hope my colleagues do too. But there are very few people within the Alzheimer's field who consider what I do as serious. There are maybe reasons for that with little to do with science. What I want you to take simply from this slide is that, oh, sorry, next one, is this slide, is that in Alzheimer's disease, the vast majority of the disease shown on the right-hand side of this slide is known as sporadic or late onset Alzheimer's. 95, 96, 97, we're not quite sure, percent of all forms of Alzheimer's disease that we get have virtually no genetic component. On the left-hand side of the image here, we also have an aspect of Alzheimer's disease known as familial Alzheimer's disease. And by that name, it suggests that there is a strong genetic linkage. So there is what I would call a predisposition. Certain genetic changes in individuals make them predisposed in my belief, to Alzheimer's. There's almost certainly many people who have these genetic predispositions who may not get Alzheimer's disease. That's the difference. There are some genetic diseases which cause disease, ge genetic mutations which cause disease. I don't consider Alzheimer's to be one of them. As was said in the introduction, you know, I, have, I started my work in 1984 on aluminium. And it's only 30 years later, in 2014, that I would be prepared to write a paper, an invited paper, with as provocative a title as this. So very briefly today, I want to sh go through with you why I have come to the conclusion that under certain circumstances, it is inevitable that human exposure to aluminium contributes to Alzheimer's disease. Inevitable. Not possible anymore, but inevitable. <laughs> we have had, over the last 10 years in particular, the great privilege to work on a number of human brains. It's always a major privilege to work on human tissue and human brain tissue, of course, in particular. It's very difficult to get the necessary ethical approval to do this. And uh, it's also the type of work, you know, when you know you're actually dealing with some brain tissue from a donor, you need to make sure you do the very best possible science with that. You use it to its very best effect. We had a fantastic opportunity a few years ago to look at 60 human brains and to look at metal content. In this case, we're talking about aluminium. The aluminium content of 60 human brains taken from a brain bank where approximately 60% of those individuals had a neurological condition, most of those Alzheimer's, and the other 40 did not. They would be controlled. They would perhaps have other conditions but would have not been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. The first thing that we found from that, which perhaps is most important in some respects, is that when you've done all these measurements, and again, I would normally give two or three lectures on exactly how we do that and, and why I am 100% confident in every data point that we produce. But if you were simply to take an average of the aluminium content of human brain tissue, you'd come up with a number around, written up here, one microgram per gram dry weight. One microgram of aluminium per gram of tissue at its dry weight. Now, if someone pressed me and said, Chris, what's the normal amount of aluminium in the human brain? First of all, I would say there is no normal amount. There should not be any aluminium in the human brain. You do not require it for any purpose. It's neurotoxic, and therefore, you don't want it in your brain tissue. But if I'm pushed, I will say, well, look, let's say we could tolerate one microgram per gram dry weight. The value, actually, we came up here when we just simply took a mean 
of 712 odd samples. <laughs> However, when you looked into the individuals, the donors who provided the brain tissue, all 60 of them, what you actually find is that in certain areas of their brain, they have quite high content of aluminium, which I would say anything above two would be considered high, and in other areas, perhaps lower. And this is something we've known for a long time, is that for the non-essential metal aluminium, aluminium is not beautifully homogeneously distributed around your brain tissue, it's in focal deposits. And it's in focal deposits associated with the type of neuropathology, actually, that you find in the brain. So it's not useful to use an average value. It tells us more or less nothing. It only actually tells us something when the average value is very high, and then we know our brain is really heavily contaminated with aluminium. Why, what examples have I come across recently, apart from that 60 human brain study, which have begun to change my mind, or at least make me absolutely certain about aluminium's role in the disease? Various types of uh, case studies. In this was a famous case where uh, individuals were exposed to aluminium through aluminium in their tap water. It's a case in England, in Camelford. Again, don't get me talking about it, otherwise you'll miss the rest of the meeting. Uh, but what we found in this, in this, a lady in her 50s who was exposed to this event in the late 80s, her husband called me after she died and was diagnosed with an unknown neurological condition. Can you find someone to, to improve on that for me, Chris? So I, look, I asked the world's, one of the world's leading neuropathologists, Margaret Asiri at Oxford University, to look at this woman's brain. She did that. She found this diagnosis of a form of Alzheimer's disease called chondrophilic amyloid angiopathy, CAA. The only thing we need to take from this is that the form of CAA she had had never been seen before in someone as young as she was. In fact, it had rarely been seen before, and only in people in their 80s or 90s. When we measured the aluminium content of her brain tissue, we found numbers that you can see on the board behind me, which are considerably higher than one or two. In other words, her brain was packed with aluminium, and she had a really rare and unusual form of Alzheimer's. Almost certainly, her, her exposure to aluminium contributed to this case. Another example which set me on my road to my current beliefs is through an occupational exposure of an individual whose job changed dramatically, such that he was asked, after working in the same company for many years, to be cleaning out a kiln where they were firing products made from aluminium. He wasn't provided with any sort of respiratory equipment. And within four or five years of working, he started to have memory problems. And in his early 50s, he was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's disease. By the time he got to mid-60s, he had died. And again, through a coroner, a uh, court got in touch with me and asked me to do the analysis on brain tissue. This gave us a mass great opportunity because we also got a very large quantity of brain tissue this time. And we were able to show in a large quantity of brain tissue a very high average amount, as we can see here. So my conclusion again here was this absolutely without any question that in this individual getting Alzheimer's 10, 15, 20 years earlier than you might expect, although we should not expect to get Alzheimer's, that this individual had and had very high levels of aluminium. The aluminium must have contributed to his disease. Actually, this is just the recent paper just showing that that place uh, in Camelford, Cornwall, we are now getting more and more brains. People are dying because they were exposed in the late 80s. They're dying now. We're getting opportunities to look at more and more brain tissue. And here is another example where someone got Alzheimer's relatively early onset in their 60s with high levels of aluminium in their brain tissue. Okay, so these, this is where we get to I think, game-changing data. Because up until now, yes, we have measured the aluminium content in human brain tissue in people, control individuals, 
people with Alzheimer's disease. And we've found a number of interesting things, including good examples of where the aluminium content has become so high that we think it's inevitable that it makes some contribution, because we know aluminium is neurotoxic. So what about the sort of blue star form of Alzheimer's disease? The familial form of Alzheimer's disease, because of the nature of the genetic mutations that are involved, is used as a template for understanding all Alzheimer's disease. We had the incredible privilege recently to get hold of brain tissue from 12 donors who had died with familial Alzheimer's disease. In this, these span 25 years, so the brain bank in London, where we got them from, had only had 12 donors in 25 years. So this shows you the rarity of true familial Alzheimer's disease. But I don't need to turn around and I don't need to use my little red laser on the numbers there for you to see what those numbers look like compared to one microgram per gram dry weight or two micrograms. These, the levels of aluminium in the brains of people who have died with familial Alzheimer's disease are the highest levels we have measured full stop in any circumstances in any brain tissue. So quite quickly we can come to some sort of assumption at least that these genetic predispositions also predispose individuals to possibly retaining very high levels of aluminium in the brain. And if that is the case, it's highly likely that the early onset form of the disease, the aggressive nature of these diseases, is brought on and accelerated by the presence of aluminium. Numbers are fine, but what about can we show, can, we, can I actually show you some aluminium in these brain tissues, just to make you even more convinced of what I'm telling you? Okay, I'm going to just slip over that. It's never ever been easy to do that, to actually show the presence of aluminium in human brain tissue and be absolutely unequivocal about it. It's took us, taken us about three years to perfect a method recently published in Journal of Alzheimer's Disease that we know we can now do that. So what I'm next going to show you are a series of slides, the brain tissue taken from some of the individuals who had familial Alzheimer's disease, who had those high numbers of aluminium in their brain tissue. It's a little bright here, so we may not be able to see too well. But what we're looking at here, so here we have some frontal cortex from an individual who died of familial Alzheimer's disease. One piece here, another piece here. This is light microscopy. We developed a method where uh, we can use a fluorescent molecule to show the presence of aluminium. Under light microscopy, you can actually see the fluorescent molecule, presumably, but we don't know yet, adhered to something within the brain tissue. When we look at the same under fluorescence, this orange is aluminium. And this is everywhere, all over these brains. Little yellow bits, that's called lipofusin. It's interesting, it's another uh, type of deposit found in the brains of all of us, and it's also associated with uh, many neurodegenerative diseases. But what I pointed out is because this slide is something called autofluorescence. It means, well, what does the tissue look like if you don't actually put the molecule that binds the aluminium in there, but you still look at it under exactly the same circumstances? And autofluorescence in fluorescence microscopy is a major issue, a major problem. So if we don't see any orange here, it means that our method is working really well. And that's what we can say from this. So just a few examples now of, and look at all these orange fluorescent images, we can't tell you yet exactly what they're associated with. That's the next stage of this piece of research. We can't tell you exactly what they are. Are they intracellular, extracellular? Are they associated with other known neuropathologies of the disease or not? We're working on that at the moment. What we can tell you is that the quantitative data we produced is 
fully backed up by qualitative data where we can literally see aluminium in the tissue. There is no doubting of this. No one from the aluminium industry, the pharmaceutical industry, or anywhere else can doubt this science. They will, but it's the best possible science. And it's taken me and my group a long time to get it right. A few more examples here. And I'll show you one last image simply because I mentioned that we're trying to say, can we see any association between the aluminium and some of the known neuropathology that you get in Alzheimer's? So one of the major neuropathologies you get in Alzheimer's is called a senile plaque. It's made of a protein called amyloid. We can use something called Congo red to show the presence of amyloid or senile plaques in human brain tissue. And you just about see here a circular structure, slightly stained red. Hopefully you can see that. It's a little bright in here. You won't see this, but we can actually look at that structure under something called cross-polarized light. And it gives, you have to take my word on this, an apple green birefringent. So you'll see apple green color there. That tells us that this is in a form, the amyloid is in a form that you find in Alzheimer's in senile plaques. We can also see this red under fluorescence quite beautifully. And if we look at the same section, but just staining for aluminium, well, we can see aluminium here, intimately associated with the senile plaque. So whether or not that implicates aluminium in some of the neuropathologies that we know and accept may be involved in Alzheimer's, we are going to move on to that and get that absolutely right. It took us three years just to get this staining method to work beautifully. But the great thing about the method is it's something that almost every lab can do. You don't need nuclear reactors or great big pieces of expensive equipment. We've managed to get a method that most labs, like my own and others, who have relatively modest facilities can do this and we can start to improve the amount of data we have in this area. So this is just a little conclusion taken from the, the, the manuscript. The manuscript has been in review now for about three months. It's quite a long review period. And I think I know why. And I think it's a game changer. And I expect this will be published in the very near future. And I hope you'll hear me again on your local or national news talking about it. Because it is time now for us to accept a role for aluminium in Alzheimer's disease. I don't have time to tell you the good news, which is, of course, that we can all protect ourselves against that. But maybe later, if we have it in the panel session or something of that sort, I can tell you where the good news lies and how you can achieve optimal health and potentially ward off Alzheimer's in the future. Uh, <laughs> Listen, if you get me started, That'll be it, there'll be no time. But listen, I'm going to tell you one thing. My research started showing how can I protect a fish from aluminium toxicity? And I showed that, remember I told you the Earth's crust is made of aluminium, silicon, and oxygen? So I showed you put silicon back into the system, it binds the aluminium, and the aluminium is no longer toxic. We have also found that if you drink water, which is high in silicon, it has a molecule in it called silicic acid, Silicon with four little OH groups around it. The good news is you produce aluminium in your urine, you produce aluminium in your sweat, you lower your body burden of aluminium, you have a protection against living in the aluminium age. I'm going to finish there. Thank you. <laughs>